to tonight's NYUAD Institute event. My name is Antje von Surodolitz. I'm faculty at the psychology program here at NYUAD. And it's my great pleasure and honor, honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Clancy Blair from NYU Steinhardt School of Culture, Education and Human Development and principal investigator of the US federally funded Neuroscience and Education Lab. Clancy is a professor of cognitive psychology and he received his doctorate in developmental psychology and his master degree in public health from University of uh, Alabama at Birmingham. And prior to joining NYU, he, was, uh, he spent 10 years at Penn State where he initiated, from my point of view, one of the most fascinating longitudinal research programs on children's and families' development. Why do I find it that fascinating? Knowing from my own experience, I quite painful experience sometimes, how hard it is to follow families over several periods of time and several appointments when they come into the lab or we go to families to collect the data. Clancy and his team, they were able to collect data of more than 1,000 children and their families. And not only that, but also they followed the kids. They started at birth, they followed them into school and ultimately into adulthood. So that is already very fascinating and impressive. In addition to that, they included, developed and included a wide variety of measures in the study. And of course, the results as they now get published are very impressive as well. So his work basically changed our understanding of children's school readiness. And our, not only school readiness, but also the various factors that influence a child's individual developmental trajectory. So when I started graduate school, I just worked for five years as a school psychologist. And I think I shared most of the of uh, uh, the, the view of school readiness of many people at that time. Basically, a child is ready for school when he or she masters early literacy and early math. Don't get me wrong, I do think that these are very important developmental milestones. But learning from Clancy's work, I do believe, <laughs> I'm convinced, that they do not tell us much about ch how children learn to learn and what are the determining factors for children to adapt to and succeed in school environments. Clancy's work has provided answers to these questions of what helps children learn to learn and how they can be successful over an extended period of time. So he um, came up with a very uh, influential new model of children's school readiness. But he did not stop at the theoretical level of introducing this new model. He also used this knowledge, not only from the study that I told you about, but from all of his other projects to translate these findings into the practice and applied fields. So how can we come up with interventions in order to help children pro, uh, succeed in school and promote their school readiness uh, skills? So he focused on the factors, both the facilitating and constraining factors of children's development and how these can be influenced through interventions both within the family, but also within the larger environment, uh, what he calls the family's ecology. So this brings me right to the topic of his talk, Ready for School, the influence of stress and support for children's early development. But let me first thank NYUAD Institute for inviting Clancy tonight to give this presentation and for organizing the event tonight. And thank you, Clancy, for accepting the invitation. Please join me in welcoming Clancy Blair. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Is the mic live? 
Great. Um, thank you so much, Ancha, for that very, very warm introduction and your kind invitation to visit. And thank you to the Institute for sponsoring my trip. It's wonderful to be here. It's uh, my first visit to the Emirates, my first visit to NYU AD. I've heard so much about the place, and it's so nice to actually see it uh, and experience it firsthand. So thank you for that. So what I want to do tonight is I want to talk with you about my research on school readiness. And as Ancha mentioned, school readiness is certainly composed of knowing letters, knowing numbers, knowing shapes, knowing colors, all of these sort of academic aspects that we would think about being ready for school. But at most, at best, that's really half the story, right? What we want to know as well, or what we think self-regulation or school readiness is composed of, is the ability to regulate behavior, to pay attention, to regulate emotion, to regulate in social interactions. Those are important in and of themselves, but they're also important for learning in school. They're important for processing information. They're important for the relationship with the teacher. They're important for the relationship with the other children. And part of that is the ability to handle stress. Right? There are stresses in the lives of young children. Starting school is a major stressor. That's one of the transitions that kids go through. And part of that is the ability to handle some of the unknown and to meet that challenge and to succeed or not in that challenge, but to learn from that and to keep trying to be persistent. And it's really those aspects of self-regulation that I found myself as I was looking at school readiness and trying to study school readiness this must have been 20 years ago now, um, and, ar and around the, the turn of the 21st century, thinking about school readiness, what does this mean? I turned to self-regulation and began to, to say, well, what is that, right? I just replaced one problem with another problem. But thinking about self-regulation, trust me, it isn't that we're trying to turn kids into little machines or little automatons, slavishly following the rules. That's not self-regulation. That's other regulation. What we're interested in when we talk about self-regulation is the extent to which children can begin to be flexible in their response to the environment in contextually appropriate ways, following social cues. So to run and play and go nuts and be exuberant and have a great time when needed, but then to stop and comply in response to adult requests, those sorts of things, right? to be really emotionally expressive, but then to regulate emotion as needed. So these are familiar to anyone who's been around young children. If you've been a parent, you're very familiar with this. If you're a teacher, if you work with young children, you're very familiar with the sort of self-regulation challenges, minimal sorts of self-regulation challenges that children face. But these are basic building blocks for school readiness. These are very, very important, perhaps more important, I would argue, than the academic aspects of school readiness. So self-regulation is really a general goal for children's development. It's important for school readiness, but where does it really come from, right? Where does it start? How can we use this understanding to, to really ask questions, scientifically valid questions about self-regulation and its development? Well, one place it starts is in, the, of course, the relationship with the caregiver, right? Very, very important. Caregivers are scaffolding children's attention, right? They're helping, here we have, oops, scaffolding children's attention, helping scaffolding regulation of emotion, and then as children age, really scaffolding their activity, right? Structuring their attention, their goal directedness, so on and so forth, struggling perhaps with a task, struggling with perhaps the ability to regulate emotion, but providing that guidance. And it's really that first regulation that's important for regulation of emotion and attention, but not only that, but also physiological regulation. Because what, of course, our parents doing initially, they're helping uh, the infant to regulate body temperature, homeostatic state, sleeping, feeding, diapering, all of that is very important. That self-regulation, that the other regulation that parents are providing is scaffolded into self-regulation in children, right? So the idea here, in a nutshell, <clears throat> the hypothesis we're investigating is the extent to which this early support for regulation of lower level systems, simpler systems, less complex systems, 
of development are really setting the stage, scaffolding the development of more complex forms of regulation. And he, by this, I mean executive function ability. So thinking skills as children begin to develop the volitional control of attention and to use the volitional control of attention to regulate emotion, to regulate action, to regulate thinking, these are the sorts of executive function skills. Now, generally they're not coming online until about age five or six or so. Uh, through some innovative measurement, we figured out we can sort of measure executive function abilities in two and a half, three-year-olds. But I, I argue, and I'll provide some data in a minute to back this up, that the early regulation of emotion and attention, and most importantly, stress physiology, is really setting the stage for the development of executive function. And um, that's what I just said. The healthy development of emotion, attention, and the stress response in infancy is going to be indicative of later healthy development of executive function, right? And the reason this is, is because self-regulation is a system. It's not one thing. It's composed of the regulation of, of thinking through executive function. And just as we can use that, those executive function skills to regulate emotion, to regulate behavior, and to regulate physiologically as a result of that, by that same measure, activity in these lower level systems and physiological systems and behavioral systems and emotion systems can facilitate or undermine our ability to engage the executive functions. Right? So both developmentally and sort of point in time, we think of self-regulation as a recursive system. It's both top down, but it's also bottom up. And especially in young children, when we're looking at the development through infancy and the toddler period, these lower level systems, behavioral, physiological, and of course there are individual differences among us that are associated with this, right? Uh, but also related to gene expression, these lower level systems are up and running. They're very active. And the idea here is they're going to shape, activity here is going to shape the development of executive functions there, right? With this recursive process. It's a developmental systems approach. I don't have time to go into that, but um, uh, Ancha and her students are well versed in developmental systems. Um, and so the interesting thing is, of course, there's a very nice neurobiology that supports this systems thinking, right? So very descriptively and basically, what's happening is, as experience is registered rapidly here, right, in limbic structures, the amygdala and hippocampus, it signals to prefrontal cortex through chemical messengers, right? So neuromodulators, really the catecholamines, dopamine and norepinephrine, and the glucocorticoid hormone cortisol. They're activated by responses in limbic structures here in the brain, and they feed forward to prefrontal cortex, and they influence activity in, in synaptic activity in prefrontal cortex. So prefrontal cortex is the seat of executive functions, right? These are the skills, these are the thinking skills that we call on when we're faced with a problem. It's like experience is saying, hey, Frontal cortex, wake up. You need to do something here. You need to formulate a plan. You need to hold information in mind and working memory. And prefrontal cortex feeds back on the limbic structures to maintain this sort of what you can think of as optimal level of arousal. Because the interesting thing about this neurobiology is that moderate increases in catecholamines, moderate in increases in cortisol, in uh, potentiate synaptic activity in prefrontal cortex, but at very low, at lower levels or at very high levels when the organism is stressed out and under duress, synaptic activity in prefrontal cortex is shut down. And this is the work of Amy Arnston and her mentor Patricia Goldman Rakich at Yale University. They really uh, uh, very eloquently showed, uh, elegant, uh, elegantly showed this in non-human primates and in rodent models. But here, this is a dopamine agonist, and this is percent correct on a working memory task. And as dopamine rises moderately, minimally, we see increases in performance and then decrements in performance as, uh, uh, as the brain becomes um, flooded, the prefrontal cortex becomes flooded with dopamine. And the way Amy describes this is turning right, the brain from a top-down mode of processing information 
to a more bottom-up mode of processing information. So this neurobiology maps really uh, maps on very, very well to the sort of model of other regulation into self-regulation, the idea that parents are providing structure for the regulation of, of a stimulation here in ways that can facilitate or undermine the development of this brain network that's so important for executive function ability. And of course, this is familiar to many <clears throat> as a, a neurobiological form of the now over a century old Yerkes Dodson law, right? You're at your best when you're somewhat anxious, right? When attention, emotion, and levels of stress hormones are somewhat uh, increased. So when you go to the job interview or when you're taking an exam, you know, this, this relationship between emotion, attention, and stress physiology and complex learning, executive function ability, is potentiated at sort of at optimal levels. And this is distinct. This is a different type of learning. Psychologists have often studied simple learning, reactivity, and fear conditioning. And here, that relationship is more linear. This one is curvilinear. So it's important when we're thinking about learning in school to think about it as complex learning, executive function skills, reasoning skills, and the idea, can we structure environments in ways that support sort of a moderate level of increase in emotion and attention in the stress response? It also gives us a way of thinking about evaluating some of those environments in some novel ways and thinking about how children are responding to schooling and are they engaged in this sort of complex form of learning? Uh, would we see that behaviorally? Would we see that physiologically? These are very, very interesting questions we don't quite have the answers to yet, but it uh, provides a platform for a program of research. So thinking about self-regulation as a system and thinking about executive function based on its neurobiology and the relations among constructs here can really help us to address some pressing issues in research on executive function and on self-regulation development, and hence school readiness, right? So how does executive function develop? Well, I've sort of given some, some, some theory behind that and some uh, hints as to the importance of the early regulation of the lower level systems. But one of the important implications for that is, what about children in poverty, right? What about children who are at risk for not receiving that higher, that higher quality of care? because of chaos in the environment or because of parental separation, those sorts of things. It really heightens the stakes for thinking about executive function development and school readiness in the context of poverty. This may be one major mechanism through which disparities in SES and socioeconomic status lead to problems with school readiness in children. If so, if we have evidence for that, can we then implement programs to try to uh, correct this problem, right? And a related issue in this is the extent to which executive function, working memory, inhibitory control, the ability to shift attention uh, volitionally, uh, can it be trained? Are there specific training programs? Or is it really dependent on sort of this systems level model that I've been thinking of? Or can we really train the top down part? And that will work best in sort of regulating the lower level parts, right? So all of these questions are sort of up for grabs. And I want to sort of walk you through some, some data on this, right? So the development of executive function, variation in the physiological, emotional, and attentional development in the early years will be indicative of the development of EF. Um, I've already said all this, developmental importance of early parenting and early education. So I want to, that's the sort of um, theory part. There's a little bit more theory part here that I just want to go into briefly. The idea here is based on one in which sort of the stress response, and when I talk about the activation of the catecholamine pathways or the glucocorticoid cortisol pathways, that's sort of information from the environment, right? And the reason I raise this is I'm not trying to say that poverty is just sort of uniformly bad for kids, right? Uh, characterized by a lack of certain appropriate types of stimulation, but it's also actively shaping a different kind of response to the environment, making it the brain more reactive and less 
sort of reflective, less of a tendency to engage in executive function. So we're really interested in stress in the infancy period, both prenatally and postnatally, and stress as it's affecting the parent as well as the child. And really, this is the psychobiological model. And the reason I bring this up again is, so the idea here is that moderate, tolerable stress can sort of build a healthy stress response. That's part of what's happening in the parent-child relationship. That's part of what's happening in a nurturing school environment. It's providing appropriate levels of challenge. This is sort of classic Vygotskyan theory in psychology. But increasingly in the United States, we've become interested in this possibility that poverty environments are increasing the uh, stress physiology and the stress response to what can be considered toxic levels. Right? So the excessive activation, ongoing activation of the stress response, is going to tune the brain to be more reactive to stimulation and less reflective, less thoughtful, less of a tendency to engage in executive function. So there's some evidence to support this. What we want to know is the extent to which this is a shapeable system, right? How early is early? How late is too late to try to change the sort of developmental system that I just laid out for you? So that's the theory part. The data part are from the longitudinal study that Ancha mentioned in the uh, introduction, in my introduction. And this has been a longitudinal study in uh, counties, predominantly low income and rural or small town counties in Pennsylvania and North Carolina that my collaborators and I started over 10 years ago now. And it's a program project grant funded by the National Institutes of Health. And what I want to talk about tonight are data collection in the home with the sample at ages 7 months, 15 months, and so on and so forth, as you can read on the screen. And this is a program project, so there were multiple aspects to the project based on family ecology, uh, family relationships, work, child language development, and my part of the project was really focused on the development of self-regulation and executive function. So what we collect in this sample of ours, right, are information on parent-child interaction, of course, which we do through a structured task, but in everything that we did, and in all my research projects, we collect saliva from babies. We also collect it from moms. Uh, we sometimes collect it from teachers. And we collect saliva to look at the glucocorticoid hormone cortisol, which we can assay from saliva. And this gives us our best indication of the physiological stress that the organism is under, right? That the child, the organism, the child and the mom, right? And so what we're doing is we're collecting that at baseline, and we're also collecting this in response to a stressor, or in this case, an emotion challenge. Right? So what we do is we give the child a, uh, an enticing toy to play with, and then we take that toy away, and we give it back to them encased in a plastic jar, which they cannot get to, and it's frustrating. And then we take the toy out of the jar and give it back to the child. Right? The other thing, so that's more of a frustration approach, frustration of approach task. The other is the presentation of scary masks, right? So this, again, is another sort of unusual event for children. And it reliably pr uh, produces um, a fear response in kids. So what we're doing is we're taking saliva samples prior to the stress response, to, I mean, prior to the emotion induction, and then taking it after and looking at change in the glucocorticoid hormone cortisol in response to the emotional stressor. And then, of course, we're following the kids forward until they're about age three when we can begin to measure executive function skills. So let me just walk you through this, right? So cor cortisol is a steroid hormone detectable in saliva. It prepares the body for a response, right? So it's good for it to be elevated, but then to decrease following a stressor event, right? So in the short run, a very good thing. And here are, we're coding the child's responses to the mask presentation, both for reactivity, but here for regulation. So reaching out to the mom is a source of regulation. There are other forms of regulation, usually avoidance, those sorts of behaviors, we're coding those. 
and again in response to the uh, uh, frustration task. And then, of course, we're, we're, we want to measure executive function, and you may be a little less familiar with some of the tasks we use to measure executive function in young children. One of these is a classic of neuropsychology called the peg tapping task. This is um, uh, a task in which when I tap one time, you tap two times, okay? And when I tap two times, you tap one time, right? So very, very simple task, but we run through 16 sort of pseudo counterbalance trials of one taps and two taps. And what we do with three and four and five year old children is establish that they can tap and establish with that they know the rules for the game and then we engage in the one and two tap trials. And with three-year-olds really can't do this sort of task, right? They really just bomb out on it. They can tap and they can tell you the rules, but you start doing it and they just mimic what you're doing, right? It's sort of that uh, auditory and motoric response. It's just too much to overcome. Four-year-olds, young fours, can hang in there with you for a few trials, but then it's if the rule just evaporates, just goes away. You know? And you can say to them, what are the rules of the game? And they can tell you the rules of the game, and you can say, let's try it again. And it's just if the rule just evaporates. You know? It's great. You say, great, good job. I really like the way you're tapping. Um, and then but five-year-olds, it's really too easy for them. right? By the fives, sixes, they can do this, water off a duck's back. right? It's just too much. It's interesting. This task was developed by Alexander Luria, who's the godfather, really, of neuropsychology. And he was developed this task with veterans returning to Russia from the Second World War, to the Soviet Union from the Second World War with traumatic injury to prefrontal cortex. And individuals with injury to prefrontal cortex cannot do this simple task. They can recite uh, uh, Shakespeare. They can do complex vocabulary. They can do a variety of things that are more knowledge-based aspects, but can't do this simple task. And this is the role illustrates the role of prefrontal cortex in organizing information uh, as much as anything. So a task we use with slightly older kids is this sort of executive function measure. And this is more the attention shifting. That was more the inhibitory control and working memory aspect of executive function. Uh, this is more the uh, shifting of attention aspect of executive function. I just want to check the time. Um, and here the task. Uh, the instruction is to the child is to show me two things that are alike on this page. Show me two things that go together. And almost invariably, children point to the two teapots. The shape is very, very salient, right? We say, great, good job, wonderful. That's right. They, those are the same. They're both teapots. Now, can you show me two things that are alike on this page in a new way? Can you show me two things that go together in a different way? And the child's task is to shift from the dimension of shape to the dimension of size, right? So we, again, we run through 16 or 20 trials of, of these tasks. And this is a very difficult task for three-year-olds. Even fours have difficulty with it. Five-year-olds are pretty good, and by six, most kids can do this completely. So what, what um, we realized when we started our longitudinal study, we wanted to measure executive function. We wanted it to measure it developmentally. We needed to develop versions of these types of tasks that we could use longitudinally, that we could use again and again, use with a three-year-old, the same set of tasks with a four-year-old, the same set of tasks for, with a five-year-old. Why? So we could look at within-person change and development, right? So each person could be his or her own baseline, and we could can better understand executive function development through that. So we developed these sorts of tasks. We couldn't really do peg tapping like that, but we could do this sort of task, where touch on the same side, touch on the side that the arrow's pointing to. And when the arrow and the response location are congruent, it's a pretty easy task. Three-year-olds can do this pretty well, but when that arrow and the response location are incongruent, it becomes more difficult. And when we intermix, oh, sorry, when we intermix the the, um, the same side and the opposite tr side trials, it becomes more difficult still. So we were able to scale this task for three to five-year-olds. Another is we wanted a working memory measure. And here what we did was we de defined working memory as holding two things in mind and responding to one of them. So we said, what colors in this house? What animals in this house? What animals in this house? So one trial version of that. And then we would do two trial versions. What animal? What animal? What color? What animal? What color? 
and then we would ask either animal or color. So shifting, children needing to hold information in mind as the demand becomes a little bit higher. So we would do one item, two item, and three item trials. And interestingly, this task becomes harder still if we make the dog blue and the bird red. It's called binding the stimulus properties. It's harder to remember them individually when they're bound in that way. So that way we've been able to scale working memory. And then for this one, the shifting task, what we realized is if three-year-olds, we, we, three-year-olds can do the task if we identify the first dimension of similarity. If we say, see, here's something that's the same. They're both flowers, right? These two are flowers. They're the same. Which of these two old pictures is like this new picture, right? So we run through trials on that as well. We have a couple of more tasks that are clever, quote unquote, like these that we use with three to five-year-olds. And this is our measure of executive function, right? So just to recap, so we're collecting cortisol from saliva. It's these, we did it at seven months when the kids were seven months, 15 months, and 24 months in response to the emotion challenge and at baseline. We have parenting observed through the structured uh, interaction, home environment, and measures of executive function when children are three, four, and five years of old. Right? And so just to say here, <clears throat> the idea that the environment of poverty is stressful for kids. We now have evidence of that. We know from uh, my study and from several other studies that children in poverty exhibit elevated levels of cortisol and other stress markers that are um, injurious, really, to the development of executive function skills. And here's some data from our study. This is just the baseline sample prior to the emotion challenge task in the kids. What we see in kids in less chaotic homes a sort of typical or normative decline in basal cortisol levels adjusted for time of day from seven months to 48 months. But we don't see that in kids in highly chaotic and stressful homes, right? It's as if the thermostat got turned on and left on in the house, right? That's the idea is that the system's adjusting to a chaotic situation by sort of always being on, right? Whereas what we see here in these guys, they're more flexible in their regulation. I don't, I'm not going to show it to you tonight, but when we did the emotion challenge tasks with kids, what we saw was these guys are more likely to show an increase in cortisol, but then a decrease in cortisol returning to baseline following the emotional stressors than are these kids. And then another thing, because we measured the parent-child interaction, we think that it's very important for the development of this system and and moms in more chaotic households, caregivers in more chaotic households, are less likely to provide that sort of sensitive support. What we saw here is that looking at change in maternal sensitivity, so from seven months to 15 months to 24 months, when mothers were becoming more sensitive in their care, right, cortisol levels in kids were going down, right? So this idea here is if these guys can receive more sensitive care, their cortisol levels will start to decline. And that's what we saw in the sample using this sort of stronger uh, analysis approach in which we're looking at within person change. We saw within mom change in sensitivity. Uh, we saw within child decreases in cortisol. Um, and that was pronounced really only for the lowest levels of sensitivity. So moms who started out very low and their sensitivity uh, and with, their infants, with their infant, if they increased in their sensitivity, we saw really a pronounced change in cortisol here. This looks like an increase here for moms who are above, above average, um, but that's, that slope is not significantly different from zero. This one is significantly different from zero. So it really gave us some hope, right? The idea that if we could go into the home, in the highly chaotic home, and help parents engage in more sensitive interactions with their children, that it would show up physiologically and it would show up for executive function. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about some data that we, uh, a study that we're engaged in now to uh, evaluate that hypothesis. And then finally, sort of looking, you know, co the complete sort of model from stress, cumulative risk in the home, related to parenting, related to cortisol, related to executive function, we found evidence for this model and it was significant through positive parenting uh, associated with lower cortisol in children and higher levels of executive function. 
And that was not true necessarily for IQ. It was really specific to executive function. And then finally, to get back to this sort of uh, reactivity and regulation, when we coded the behavior for the children in response to these tasks, we saw that highest levels of executive function were among kids who were very emotionally reactive to the tasks, but who exhibited high levels of regulation. So again, it isn't that we were expecting kids to just be very chill in response to seeing the mask or having the toy taken away. No, it's fine. Have a, you know, have a, have a, have a very strong emotional response, but engage in, a, in uh, regulatory behaviors. Engage in behaviors that help downregulate that response. It's perfectly consistent with the idea that the increase and decrease in physiology is going to be very important for executive function. And that's sort of what we found with this. Right? So building on that, the idea that moderate levels of stress, right, the ability to handle stress is really super important for executive function development uh, and for the ability and for school readiness. Right? So there is some strong evidence in animal models, mainly squirrel monkeys and some rodent models that sort of intermittent stress and those models through experiments, really, where you can induce stress and then take it away, induce stress and take it away. Um, those models suggest that um, animals who've experienced that have higher level of sort of working memory uh, and are better able to regulate their behavior. But there's very little evidence in humans, right? Because we can't experimentally induce stress um, with with humans, right? We just can't, we can't put them in a straitjacket. We can't do these sorts of things, um, nor would we want to. But we did induce stress in, um, in our sample with the emotion response. And so what we looked at was the extent to which um, would we see higher levels of executive function for children whose cortisol was more variable from seven months to 48 months of age. And that's exactly what we saw here. So here's executive function uh, at school entry. And what we see is just taking the standard deviation uh, for children whose uh, average values of cortisol were low, right? Low mean levels of cortisol, more variability was associated with um, an a higher level of executive function skill over time. And that's just a sample there, right? So getting back to school readiness, and I just want to check the time. I think I'm on time. Um, when we think about self-regulation, and based on the longitudinal data that uh, I've just presented to you, we have some evidence for this model. The idea that um, we can promote school readiness, and we can promote executive function development. Um, and the importance of doing this, especially for children in poverty. Right, both through uh, innovative preschool programs and through programs that we might take into the home. Um, and the idea here is that, is this some sort of form of working memory training, of executive function training? What would this look like? So there's some very good evidence in adults that sort of repetitive training of executive function leads to changes in executive function ability and leads to changes in brain areas associated with executive function skills. Would we see the same thing in children? What would this look like? Can we structure children's experiences in school in ways that are consistent? So I don't think it would necessarily be a good idea to sit kids down and have them do repetitive practice on video games doing working memory challenges. Perhaps. Perhaps we should do that. I don't know. Kids might like it. They might find it boring. But I think it's probably better indicated from the data that I've just been presenting that we structure environments in ways that are going to be sort of maximally challenging for children. Provide the sorts of experiences, the sorts of um, types of moderate stress in preschool environments and in parent-child uh, interactions that can support the development of executive function and self-regulation. I think this is inherent to definitions of high-quality pre-K education. I think it's inherent to the definition of high-quality parent-child interaction. And one program in particular that I saw this in was a 
preschool, uh, pre-kindergarten and kindergarten program known as Tools of the Mind. So I talked to the developers about that. I was giving a talk on executive function once about 10 years ago, and one of the developers of Tools of the Mind came up to me and said, I think I have a program that changes executive function, that increases executive function. I said, oh, that's, that's very nice. And she began to describe it to me, and I, the more and more I heard about it, the more and more I thought, yeah, that probably does, you know? So we, of course, the pace of science being slow and glacial, we started to write a proposal to, to do a randomized controlled trial of Tools of the Mind. That was in about 2007. Got funded about 2008. I just published the results of the trial last year, right? We gotta find a way to speed this stuff up. But what I'll do is I'll tell you about this Tools of the Mind. It's, what it's doing is it's sort of taking the teacher out of a direct didactic role and really seeding children responsibility for their own learning. So it's very child-directed. And the way it does that is through play-based and interaction with peers uh, around structured sociodramatic play that in, has embedded academic content. So it's a very well-developed um, thing. Children are planning and reflecting on what it is they're going to do every day. They're planning their play. They're planning their activities. Um, and here's... Uh, a child's play plan, talking about what the child is going to do, and they will, in pre-kindergarten, they will enact something from everyday life, like going to the store or going through uh, the drive through window at the fast food restaurant or things like that. Things that children love to play, like going to the, the beauty shop or things like that. Um, as well, uh, children do sort of, here's a math activity, an ordinality activity that children do collectively. And the idea here is this child is the doer, he's doing the activity, this child's the checker, he's checking this child's actions, and then they swap roles, right? And this is all under the guidance of the teacher, but the teacher's one step removed from this. She's not directly overseeing this activity. She's letting the children work together and then, uh, and then stepping in as needed. As well, there is a sort of a not elaborate, but um, st strong professional development component to, uh, to Tools of the Mind. So it's, much, it's based on much of the information that I've been talking to you about tonight in terms of executive function development and influences on executive function, and really explaining to teachers how and why the activities contribute to the development of executive function and how that's important for self-regulation. Um, and there's also a, a coaching model with this. If you're familiar with successful programs, what these programs do is not simply provide the information in a professional development day or two, but they provide a regular coaching model, which is about every two weeks during the first year of the program and monthly during the second year of the program. So there's support. There has to be support for these things. We can't just train teachers and expect that some of them will do them very well, but many, many need support. So here's the kindergarten version, and the kindergarten version is also um, uh, structured around play activities. These are fictional activities, so the magic treehouse books in which children, um, are, the teacher reads a chapter with the children, and then the children build the sets, make the props, and then enact the, the chapter each day. And they connect that with their uh, prior learning, and here's a, an example of a lesson plan that kindergartners go through they plan what they're going to do in each of the centers, so the listening center, the, the stories and centers, the investigation center, penmanship, word puzzles, and so on and so forth. They plan this, and then about the middle of the year, they meet with the teacher to discuss their learning goals. These are kindergartners, and they're discussing their learning goals and their plans for their learning, what they want to work on, and so on and so forth um, through, the, through the kindergarten year. And so what we did was we conducted a cluster randomized controlled trial of this um, with that many district schools, classrooms, and children. And the important feature of this analysis is that the uh, poverty level in the schools range from very, very affluent to very, very poor. Um, and we uh, collected data with the children in the fall and the spring of kindergarten and then followed them up in the fall of the first grade. And really what we saw in the sample overall was small, I would say small effects here, right, across a number of measures, work memory, executive function, uh, a measure of attention, speed of processing, mathematics, reasoning, and vocabulary. 
But when we looked in the high poverty schools, we saw much larger effects, right? So the idea that schools in general, kindergartens in general, with kids who are coming from pretty affluent homes in which their self-regulation skills are pretty well developed, kindergarten as such, business as usual, kindergarten is working pretty well. But for kids from high poverty homes, we're really seeing big effects on executive function, on the control of attention, um, and on reasoning and vocabulary. Exactly sorts of the areas in which we would think that increases in executive function would be very important and valuable for kids. And then as well, when we followed the kids up, we saw that in the sample as a whole, the kids were growing faster in their reading into first grade. This was a very surprising finding. Not one that was really expected, but the kids were growing faster, right? So this is an effect on the slope with in-person change, slope into first grade. So there, it seems as if the program is working as advertised. Kids are better able to engage with schooling and extract information um, and learn in school uh, when they have something like a Tools of the Mind program. And we all saw this same effect on vocabulary. So here's the control group and the tools group uh, at the end of kindergarten and into the first grade. So we're seeing effects on growth and vocabulary as well. So very sort of very exciting findings. And then as well sort of if, if we're seeing these effects, we should see this in the classroom quality as well. And here's a measure of sort of the organization of the classroom. And what this shows is that those large effects in poverty schools are in part perhaps driven by an effect on classroom organization. So the, the solid line is the tools of the mind group, the dashed line is business as usual classrooms, and what we see is tools of the mind makes a kindergarten classroom in a high poverty school really look no different from a kindergarten classroom in a low poverty school. However, in the control group we see uh, an expected uh, depressing relation between classroom organization and the uh, level of poverty in the school. So this really has given us a food for thought in terms of thinking about different ways to structure preschool, structure kindergarten environments for children, um, and think about self-regulation, the extent to which the context of the school classroom is supporting or undermining self-regulation and executive function. Um, and this focus on the social emotional environment of the classroom and the teacher-child relationship was really suggested to us by uh, an earlier study uh, that a colleague of mine in the Department of Applied Psychology at NYU, Sabelle Raver, she's also a vice provost for academic affairs at the university um, uh, and uh, vice provost for research. And this is an intervention in which she really um, uh, focused on the emotional climate of the classroom in terms of classrooms with children with high levels of behavior problems and the extent to which those behavior problems could be addressed by arming teachers with a way to address behavior problems in children through a program called the Incredible Years, as well as providing a mental health consultant. And she conducted a uh, randomized controlled trial uh, in preschool classrooms for children in poverty, the Head Start program, and found that the program did, in fact, increase the positive climate, decrease the negative climate, Right? So almost like an implementation check and uh, increased teacher, teacher sensitivity and behavior management. And as well, there were effects on children's executive function and their ability to control attention as well as on uh, aspects of academic learning. So again, some additional evidence suggesting that supporting right, the emotional climate of the classroom, targeting one of those lower level right, processes is going to be important for children's executive function ability and for their learning in school, right? So we've been using that, Sabelle Raver, really in particular um, with Pamela Morris, also in my department at NYU, partnering with New York City as it rolls out universal pre-K. So New York City is now committed to providing pre-K for all, publicly funded pre-K, and Sabelle and Pamela and a group at NYU and the Steinhardt School have been collecting executive function data with all kids in universal pre-K and sort of mapping that to poverty locations in the city. So here's an index of poverty. Darker areas are higher concentrations of poverty 
darker areas are more problems with executive function, and just providing information to um, the city about the sort of pre-K environment and the extent to which executive function skills, school readiness skills, may be promoted or uh, areas of highest need. And then finally, um, as I wrap up, I just want to say we've been focusing on the pre-K years and the pre-K and kindergarten environment. What about starting early? Sabelle and I have been running a program that's uh, a collaboration with early Head Start programs to try to change uh, and support parenting in uh, high poverty homes, right? With the idea that the stressors of poverty are really going to shape adult self-regulation the way they're shaping child self-regulation. And they're going to really impact um, parenting behavior through, in part through parents' appraisals of child behavior. So what we've been doing is we're part of this buffering toxic stress consortium that's funded by the Administration for Children and Families uh, in the United States. Um, and the idea here is that we can train the early Head Start home visitors, provide the early Head Start home visitors, I should say, with a curriculum that's directly focused on parenting behavior. And we've been using um, a specific uh, parenting behavior um, program called Play and Learning Strategies. It's a 14-lesson curriculum, um, which really focuses on the sort of extent to which parents are reading and responding to their baby's signals, right? and responding with sort of uh, thoughtful, scaffolded, uh, reflective approaches to children's behavior and uh, sort of things like behavior problems or crying or uh, helping children to regulate emotion and to direct attention. So what this involves is sort of watching a DVD, a video recording of a, of a high quality parent-child interaction, then the parent and the child uh, engaging in that interaction while being videoed, and then the early Head Start home visitor discussing the parent's behavior and reasons for his or her behavior uh, in that interaction. And it's proven very, very effective in the evaluations that Susan has run um, in Texas, and we're hoping for the same thing in um, New York City, and there are a couple of other locations around the country using this. But we don't have data yet from that. But our goals in this study have been to sort of look at the relationship between poverty and stress in parents, to see a, the extent to which this is a doable thing. Can we train home visitors to implement this curriculum? These are, these are sort of typical early Head Start home visitors, many of them who were early Head Start parents themselves, so coming from poverty. Uh, and then doing an experimental evaluation of it. And so far, so good. It looks like we really have been able to train the home visitors to do this um, up to uh, a certification process, right? So um, it looks like at least that, and by all reports from the home visitors and the Head Start agencies that we're working with, um, they like this program a lot. So hopefully we'll have some results um, as we finish up data collection on this project. Uh, and move to analysis, right? All right, so that really brings me to the conclusion. So what I've been talking about here is, is education as a process, right? So being science-based in our understanding of why we're doing what we're doing, whether it's in pre-kindergarten or kindergarten, or applying it to an early Head Start home visit, right? So we know that if we want to support school readiness and executive function development, I think we know we, we can do a good job introducing kids to letters and numbers and shapes and colors. Pre-K has that down without any problem. What we need really is an approach that really focuses on self-regulation and executive function development. And by that approach, it's not just a top-down model, but looking at the support for emotion, looking at the support for attention, and looking at support for self-regulation. Right? And again, I just want to emphasize, it's not necessarily, I'm not saying that all stress is bad. There's positive stress. The idea that um, that's sort of appropriate levels of support and appropriate levels of challenge can really scaffold the development of executive function over time. Um, it's clear, I think, from not, not just from my data, but from many other studies as well, 
that we have the information to really close the school readiness poverty gap. That information exists. There's no doubt about it. What lacks, I think, is the political will to do it. Right? I thought in my career, wow, you know, if I could provide evidence that might suggest that we can close the poverty gap through innovative parenting programs and innovative pre-K programs, I would have, you know, I would have, I would be fulfilled, right? That's great. And then I ran the studies. These are hard studies to run, but I ran the studies and I waited for the world to beat a path to my door. You know what? The world didn't beat a path to my door. I had to beat a path to the world's door. And I'm still here just telling you we have evidence. We know what to do. We can close that gap. But we lack the political will to do it, right? That's just the case right now. And I don't see really any great signs of change, but hopefully that will come. I don't mean to turn this into a political speech by any means. But I do think uh, we have the kind of information that's science-based that can help us decide what to do, right? And with that, we can enact programs and policies. And I think New York City and some other places around the country and around the world are really moving toward these sorts of models that are self-regulation based, that are stress based. Uh, and there are many, many organizations that are working hard to make this a reality. So with that, I want to stop. Thank you so much for your time and your attention and your patience in hearing me through tonight. During the course of development, some stress is actually good for kids. Are there moments during development, maybe from you know one through seven or eight, where stress at certain points is better for them to handle things than it is at other times? So parents might know when to really watch it versus to be a little more lax. Yeah. And then my second question for you has to do with, in schools where there's more affluence, if you, if, if, if children from underprivileged families are placed into those schools, do they start to do better inherently? Huh. Those so, are great questions. I wish I had great answers. <laughs> um, but your first question is really one of sort of developing the parameters around sort of these different periods in children's development, and we just don't have those yet. That would be a major scientific accomplishment in my mind. If we knew that it's say with a child at 18 months with a specific sort of profile is more or less malleable, but at 24 months, we're gonna see a very different sort of malleability profile and then so on and so forth. That would be wonderful information to have. And what it links to, of course, are some sensitive critical period types of information. And the best data now currently come from the, uh, the, the Bucharest, Bucharest Early Intervention Project, which is the first randomized controlled trial of high quality foster care for children who were reared in institutional care settings in Romania. Uh, and my colleagues Chuck Nelson, Nathan Fox, Charles Zena, and a, and a host of people have, have done the evaluation. Um, people would say, why would you randomly assign in that situation, right? Uh, we know it's bad to remain in foster care. You need to get out of those environments. But unfortunately, there are millions and millions of children around the world in those um, horrific care environments. And so they are doing an experiment. It's a small sample experiment. And what they found is that if children are adopted out prior to two years, they show much more recovery than if they're adopted out, a, out later. Now, whether that's actually in, in, uh, evidence of a sensitive period or critical period, I, I don't know. My own thinking is no, that's, that's not the case, that change is possible and recovery is possible. It may take a more intensive sort of approach after that and some other things. It, it's not a, it, you know, by all means we can't declare, you know, we understand now the critical period, sensitive period thing, but it's been very compelling information, especially around the early is better thing. In relation to your second question, I don't know of data sources that can specifically address that. There should be some available in terms of the mix in the classroom, which would be sort of re a readily made, a ready-made analysis. There are some similar types of programs uh, for, for families, um, the Moving to Opportunity study in Chicago, in which families in deep poverty could enter a lottery system to move to a more affluent and better off neighborhood in Chicago. 
Um, and results of that initially were mixed, but they found that for certain families, that program worked incredibly well, both for the parents and for the children and their academic achievement and um, their friendships. You can imagine there would be some downside to that. So I think it's complicated to consider all of the forces at work in that. But in general, I would think that um, what we would see from an analysis of the sort of ratio of, of poor to more affluent in a classroom um, is better outcomes relative to their um, less affluent peers in other classrooms. But unfortunately, you know, as the US education system is structured, those kids are pretty rare, right? Because there's incredible segregation of educational opportunity based on the tax base in the United States. I just want to thank you. It's very um, enlightening to hear this. I am an early childhood teacher. Thank you. Um, so I've worked with children from diverse backgrounds. I actually teach here in the UAE. Um, and I guess the, the, the poverty part of it is what I've observed and maybe, I don't know if you've had any studies, is how does wealth, we have a lot of globalization. Mm -hmm. um, even in America, we have a lot of change. Uh, I actually have worked with children on the extreme end of this. Yeah. Um, that parents are working, are overcompensating, um, that are exhibiting similar behaviors yeah. as poverty, ch children in poverty. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know if there's any studies that, you know, being at education and our economic changes, maybe about for every five years, yeah. is it evolving to show that um, even on the wealth side that there are parenting issues? Um, and I think that kind of piggybacks on what the gentleman may have been saying in the mm -hmm. back. So if you could share a little bit about that. Yes, that is a wonderful point. I, I have limited information to provide about that, but that is certainly the case in which um, income in and of itself or affluence in and of itself is not really the best indicator. And I have tried not to focus that much on it in talking about it. Um, it can provide for the type of care that we think is so um, important for children's early development. But of course, all of the pressures of work all the pressures of stress, all the pressures on families to earn, 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 um, and to, to work longer hours are really going to interfere with that, with that parental, with that parental care. And there are a couple of organizations. One is the Work Family Institute in the United States. It's run by a woman named Ellen Galinsky, who's really been hammering away at this with corporations and getting them to sort of look at their child and family leave policies around that and to really get that information in there. Um, I think she's been moderately successful at it. The other is um, really on the adolescent, on the flip side of that, um, research on a group of very affluent kids in New York City who are not doing well at all in their behavior. They're struggling. You know, They might be keeping up with their grades, but they're really struggling with other aspects of their lives. They're really struggling with their decision making. They're um, having a very, very difficult time. So uh, this researcher uh, at Columbia University has been looking at sort of indicators of who comes through that and does well with the idea that we take that information and use it to provide or support kids' development and adolescence. So I haven't talked at all about that, getting back to this idea of um, is change possible throughout childhood? I certainly believe so. I just think we need different strategies to address it. Uh, one of the strategies we use, I'm from Texas, so mm -hmm. I'm with Susan Lambert. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> that you may have heard of her. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, what I saw in the school that I had in Texas that I uh, had started, I used it, and I saw the children taking the behavior, mm -hmm. their self-regulation home to the parents. Yes. So they would use much of the vocabulary, the language on the parents. Yeah. Of course, we did parent training much like tools of the mind, right. uh, as you spoke of. But yeah. uh, I would imagine tools of the mind is starting to make those mm -hmm. kind of bottom-up changes. I've heard some parent testimonials to that effect too, both with the play and learning strategies and the tools of the mind. Te parents 
um, it's wonderful to listen to and to hear when parents are talking about that, seeing their children in a new way, and then actually taking cues from their children in terms of behavior and ways to regulate emotion. Thank Hi. you. Um, I'm a primary school teacher. I wanted to know what are the long-term implications for educationalists? Ah. And how does this inform perhaps a better handling of the parent-teacher dynamic, Ooh. that relationship? That's good. That's, a very, that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, it's really interesting in terms of sort of the tools of the mind. There's no explicit parent component. And people have often asked about that. Like, so if this is important, what can I do at home? What can I do at home? And I think it's structuring activities around that when parents are taking cues from children. They're seeding children the respect that they're little thinking beings, that they're able to form opinions, they're able to articulate their opinions. They may not be right. They may be manifestly incorrect sometimes. But for the parent not to say, no, you're wrong, but for the parent to begin to point out different ways and to encourage this sort of reflection that's so central to self-regulation. So that would be, if there could be a parent version or a parent component to tools of the mind, that's what I would think that it would be. That that would be the teacher-child, the teacher-parent relationship about the child's development would really be sort of uh, letting these ideas seep into the parent's own behavior with the child and try to get them in sync with what's going on at school, which of course, you know, is typical for the... I haven't yet. <laughs> um, only myself as a parent of three now grown children, thank God, um, uh, who are all doing well. Um, but I think in, in, that's, what I, that's what I always push for in school and my relationships with teachers. I wanted to know not like how many letters or how many numbers or how much math, but how, how are the children doing in school? Like how are they getting along? How are they getting along with others? What's the relationship with the teacher like? And all of those sorts of things. So. Good evening, Professor. First of all, thank you so much. That was truly, truly, truly very inspiring. Um, I am personally a huge fan of the tools of the mind technique that you were telling us about. But as a student, like a mere beginner in psychology, the one thing that scared me a little bit was the, the idea of children setting their learning goals at such a young age. Yes. And, uh, and being a student, that's why I'm like, oh, okay. But uh, I think it was more, when do, and I think it's really great that we're doing that, but when do you know you're pushing the boundaries too far? That's mm, I, would, I would have to have a tools of the mind teacher answer that question. That is a great question, though. Um, again, I think it's the sensitivity in the teacher-child relationship or the parent-child relationship to know sort of from a Vygotskyan zone of proximal development, when is too far, you know, and to really a appropriately do that. And one of the things I do like about tools of the mind is it frees the teacher up from a little bit of the didactic teacher role, the whole class, to say, these kids, they are, you know, they're firing on all cylinders. They are, these groups here are these kids. I'm going to pair this child with this child who's firing on all cylinders and begin to address that. So the teacher can be more attentive to sort of learning gaps or issues around learning goals and know when to bring you know, more information in or throttle back a little bit on others. That's, what, that's been the experience or the sort of testimonial that I've heard from the Tools of the Mind teachers when they're describing their experience with the program. Hi, Professor Blair. Hi. Thank you so much for your captivating talk, and thank you for taking my question. Sure. Um, as a high school student and as someone living in the 21st century, <laughs> I found that people are getting less and less sleep these days. Ah, uh -huh. um, based on that your is an excellent previous question. studies and yeah. experience, have you found any indication of long-term sleep deprivation on cognitive and neurological development? Absolutely, yes, <laughs> and I'm living proof. But. Um, <laughs> We know that one way to mess up your cortisol really fast is to go through three nights of without sleep, right? So one of the things that's actually less well measured in our longitudinal study and in all of our studies is how much sleep kids are getting and how much sleep parents are getting. So believe me, I'm asking that question in all future studies that I do now, and I've been collaborating with a couple of sleep researchers. If you're interested in this topic, Mona El Sheikh 
at Auburn University in Alabama is a really a world's leading expert on sleep research in, in children. Um, I would start with Mona if you wanted to learn more about that topic. So, thank you again, thank you. Nancy, for yes. this talk. And